everyone, and welcome back to another Change the Air Foundation interview. My name is Kendra Seymour, and I'm joined today by a very special guest who's going to be talking to us about our indoor air quality. Uh, I'd like you to meet Dr. Catherine, Catherine Carvlin. Excuse me. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Now, for those who don't know her yet, I want to tell you just a bit about her background. Uh, she's a practicing naturopathic primary care at the Institute of Complementary Medicine in Seattle, Washington. She specializes in helping patients to get to the root cause of environmentally acquired illnesses, such as mold illness, metal toxicity, multiple chemical sensitivity, autoimmune disease, infertility, and complex digestive issues. Dr. Carvelin holds a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in holistic nutrition, and a doctorate degree in naturopathic medicine. She completed a postdoctoral residency at Bastyr University, where she now teaches aspiring ND students how the environment impacts health. To further promote awareness of environmental medicine, Dr. Carvelin serves as the president of the National Association of Environmental Medicine, working alongside environmental medicine leaders to educate clinicians and increase public awareness. I absolutely love what you're doing. I think it is so needed, and it's something that I think more people you know, could benefit from the knowledge and expertise that you're bringing. So I'm, I'm so glad that you know, we're going to be talking about this today. Yeah, um, thank you. Looking forward to it. Oh, I love it. And I know we kind of talked before and we have so much good information. So we're going to we're going to do our best to get through all of it in the time. But I know at the end, you'll give us some, you know, resources where people can go uh, if they have follow up questions or, or to get into contact with you. But let's let's start at the beginning. What are some common, you know, pollutants in our air that people need to be thinking about that maybe they're not? Yeah, so there's there's really four main categories of air contaminants. Um, which include both indoor and outdoor um, pollutants. So the first is like the particulates themselves, thinking about car exhaust, smoke from wildfires and tobacco, um, biological contaminants like mold spores and other allergens, um, and even rubber from the breakdown of tires. Next, we have the group of gases. So ozone, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxides, all of those things that come from traffic pollution. And we have radon, which is a, an odorless gas that can um, is produced by the decay of, of um, uranium in the soil and water. We have water disinfection byproducts that volatilize, you know, especially in showers and bathrooms. Um, and then we have mycotoxins, right, which I like to think of a lump in the category of gases because they're so tiny and they behave like gases. Um, and then we have the air toxics. Um, and those are things like persistent organic pollutants like flame retardants, dioxins, organochlorine pesticides. Um, we have asbestos that comes from like those older buildings, anything like toxic metals, you know, um, coal factories release mercury, thinking about um, factories and industry. Then we have hydrocarbons, so like gasoline, coal, charcoal, natural gases. Um, and those react with other gases like nitrogen oxides and can make ozone. Uh, we have herbicides, we have solvents, formaldehydes, um, just so many different chemicals that could be in our air. Um, and then we also have a, a newer toxicant that I like to consider an air pollutant, um, electromagnetic radiation, which I think we'll, we'll touch on a little bit later. And so there's lots of these different toxins. You know, not everyone has the same amount of exposure, right? If you live in an urban area, you're more likely to be exposed to diesel and those traffic gases versus if you live in a rural or agricultural area, maybe you have more pesticide exposure. Or if you live near a factory, of course, that puts you more at risk for those specific chemicals, um, you know, in that factory. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot to think about there. I think we tend to think about, you know, wildfire smoke or those smoggy days you see pictures of like certain cities where it's more heavily polluted and you think oh i can see that that's bad but really so many of these things you're talking about are so small that we can't see them they're odorless often colorless they're invisible to the naked eye and so it's almost an out of sight out of mind kind of thing which means that they're overlooked and they're dismissed as you know causes or um, factors that are going to make conditions, you know, health conditions worse. And, and that's, that's really hard, um, to get people to wrap their mind around that this thing they can't see could be impacting their health. Yeah, exactly. It's a, a constant, and that's just, you know, 
um, organizations like yours are promoting awareness. And, you know, that's really the first step is just educating people and saying, hey, look, these are, you know, real, they're in in your day to day life, like we can test for them, we can look for them. And um, there are solutions, which is the um, important part. I know I was like, that was a, a whole laundry list. But the yeah. good news is there are um, daily steps that we can take to significantly reduce our exposures. I love that. And we're definitely going to get to, I think, some of those tips that you have for us. I think too, you know, for anyone listening, and I feel like I say this all the time, but the the stat is just so shocking that the average person spends more than 90% of their time indoors. So, you know, I, I hit a, the 40 milestone uh, not too long ago. And I think that equates to like 36 years of my life indoors. And so I want to make sure that the air that I'm breathing, that the air that everyone is breathing is safe. So let's talk about then like who is impacted by these indoor pollutants? Are certain individuals or groups more at risk? What what can you tell us about that? Yeah. So, I mean, like you're right, like 90% of, um, you know, people spend 90% of their time indoors and then sensitive groups like the young and older adults often spend even more than that indoors. Um, and, and people with like chronic respiratory or cardiovascular diseases, and, and they're more sensitive, they're more impacted by these air pollutants. Um, and then just broadly, like, you know, the American Lung Association um, sent out a report in a couple years ago Uh, that 40% of the U.S. population lives in an area with poor air quality. Um, So, you know, it's not an an underwhelming amount, right? Like uh, almost half of us are are impacted. And the WHO estimates that um, both indoor and outdoor pollution contributes to the premature death of over 7 million people every year. Um, You know, pneumonia, stroke, heart disease, COPD, lung cancer, right? Like air pollution is a critical risk factor for um, these conditions and and death from those conditions. So it it is a big concern. um, And the more time we spend indoors, the the newer building techniques that we have, right, like have increased concentrations of indoor pollutants, we use more um, synthetic building materials. And we have tighter homes, which is, you know, better for efficiency. Um, and can be better in in cases like wildfire um, smoke ex- events. But between that, the furnishings, your personal care products, household chemicals that you're using and keeping and storing indoors um, with no way for your house to breathe and, and exchange air um, increases our uh, indoor air pollution. Yeah, I mean, I think some of dubbed us, you know, the indoor generation for a reason, because now we're, you know, we're indoors, we're not bringing in fresh air. We're not filtering the air very efficiently or well in our homes. And then, so we buy like plugins and candles and air fresheners, and we make our homes smell better by adding one chemical to cover up <laughs> another odor. And, you know, I, I've even heard it said that VOCs, which, you know, off gases from a lot of your building materials, your furniture and flooring and stuff is like the new secondhand smoke. And when, you know, I grew up in the eighties, I remember walking into restaurants and buildings and people smoking and coming home and just smelling like that. And that's very noticeable. But when you're talking about some of these things that don't always have an odor, again, you're not thinking about it. It's not on your radar. And so I'm I'm glad we're having this conversation then. Um, So it sounds like really, you know, like this is an everyone problem, you know, whether you're young or you're old, there's going to be some more um, groups that spend more time indoors that maybe you're going to be more susceptible than others. But um, it's definitely something that, you know, all of us need to be thinking about. Yes, so, exactly. So what, let's talk then, let, let's, let's talk indoors a little bit more. Let's, it's, you know, for where we are in, in the world, like it's fall and winter is coming and, you know, people are thinking, oh, fireplaces. And then that makes me think about our stoves and gas appliances and those can impact our indoor air quality. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so gas appliances, things like um, space heaters, stoves and ovens, fireplaces, furnaces, water heaters and dryers, right? All of these um, appliances can release nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide into our air. Um, and the regulations for how well or, or what needs to be vented or not vented are pretty poor. Um, California has some better ventilation requirements for the gas appliances. But, you know, if your stove does not have a vent that goes 
you know, not just like filtered, but like up and out through your house, um, you are being exposed every time you cook, right? Which is frequently. Um, and those um, ventilations are really important for reducing, you know, those exposures um, to nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide. And then even with, if you do have a vent, you know, a, a filter, like if it just vents your stove specifically really just vents to your, um, you know, just kind of up above your, your stove area um, and it has a filter in it. That works about 30% um, efficiency. So not, not a whole lot, but better than nothing. Um, and then it also depends on like how hot your burner is, you know, are, is it all the way hot? Is it just simmering? And then back burners are better than using front burners. If you have a gas stove, we're, we're, you know, we're talking about gas stoves here because um, the back, if you use a back burner, um, the, the um, fumes come up through the filter and out the vent right before they get to you. Um, and so those end up being more efficient. So I cook with um, using my back burners as much as possible um, because of that. And so that, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that, but that's a little teaser of like more, more um, daily lifestyle routines that you can do to reduce your exposure. Um, there's some research that fireplaces that are unvented can lead to toxicities from um, these harmful chemicals within just a few hours, right? And so if you have an unvented gas fireplace that you're using while you're cooking, um, and you have a, a children at home, even if those children have you know, asthma or other respiratory issues, if they're sick, you know, you want to sit by the fire, um, those all predispose you for exacerbations for your chronic health issues, um, you know, like COPD, and then um, even put you more at risk for res developing respiratory infections, uh, just from that inflammation from those exposures. Yeah, I mean, those are all really good things to think about. And and I love your little tip about the back burner because you'd be amazed. I'm surprised they even have like oven uh, ovens where you don't have some sort of ventilation. And the other thing is people think like you have to turn it on. Like I know it seems like one of those things like people do and run it during cooking and even for a little bit after. Put it on high, you know, put yeah. it on the full speed, yeah. And, and I always laugh when I see those ones, like where they, it's usually like the microwave above and it just blows the air back at you. I'm like, oh, no, you want it venting outside. You want to make sure it's in good working order. And, you know, you mentioned it's funny, the filters, I pop mine off and clean little tip people. You need to be cleaning those. Um, and it's really just like a metal mesh, which I mean, it, that's not really catching large particles. It's going to catch like the oils and some of the stuff that comes up from, you know, your boiling water or whatever you're doing. Um, but always to be sure that, you know, you're using that, you're maintaining it. I love the back burner tip because I know um, you, you kind of alluded to carbon monoxide for a moment. So let's, let's pivot there for a second. Can you tell us about that? Because people think, oh, well, I have my carbon monoxide detector on the wall. Like, is that enough? What do people need to be thinking about? Yeah, so um, it it's often not enough. Um, your your gas appliances do can release carbon monoxide, especially your furnace, like your gas powered furnace. And um, if your furnace is installed incorrectly, doesn't have the proper venting outside, um, and you know, depending on where your furnace is, um, the carbon monoxide can build up and come through the vents in your HVAC system and enter your home. Um, and depending on where your detectors are, a lot of them, you know, people just say, oh, I have a, a carbon monoxide detector, like ingrained with my fire, um, you know, detector on the ceiling. But you need to have them kind of lower down on the ground um, to pick up, especially if you're concerned, you know, getting your furnace maintained and, and maintenance, making sure they can check, you know, when they come and um, service your furnace, they can check to make sure that the carbon monoxide is at, at low or undetectable levels. Um, but having those meters in your house is another layer of protection that you can have. Um, because yeah, carbon monoxide, you don't smell it, you know, you don't notice it. Fatigue and like neurological symptoms, headaches are, are some of the first signs. Um, and it, it's a, a, you know, very dead, potentially even deadly um, toxin and um, really important to be aware of and make sure that your home is safe. 
Yeah, especially, you know, sometimes you hear stories in the winter, people will lose power and then they rely on like generators and things like that. Those are always things to be aware of. But I think one of the things that people need to be thinking about too is even if you have your, you know, you probably had a regular carbon monoxide detector on your wall and that's great. When that goes off, that means the levels are like, so high, immediate danger, you're at risk of death. Like you need to get out, you call the fire department or whatever. But I have worked with people who, and I have them in my own homes. I, I have, they're rated for low level carbon monoxide exposure. And that's a separate monitor and you can get them for like hundred, but you know, there's different kinds um, online. And that's because it's more often, you know, those, those low level leaks that are subtle. It's not enough to trip your regular carbon monoxide detector but it can cause problems. And I've talked with people who are like, oh, we're not getting better. And they remediated the areas. And we mentioned the stove and it turns out, you know, they called the gas company and they found a low level leak. And once they fixed that, their headaches went away. And so it's about keep asking questions and, and things like that. So a, a low level, you know, rated carbon monoxide detector um, could be a smart addition um, for somebody listening. Yeah, totally. Now, we, we kind of talked on this before. We live in this high-tech world, wireless. And what are some like high-level stuff? Because this could be many episodes on its own that people need to be aware of when it comes to EMFs. Well, what are EMFs? Talk to us about all that. Sure, sure. So EMFs, right, electromagnetic fields. And we're talking about like this non-ionizing radiation, right? So not X-rays or CT scans, um, just this non-ionizing lower grade form that comes from things like our Wi-Fi, our cell phones, Bluetooth devices, earbuds, um, you know, the wireless earbuds, any of those wireless devices, even our microwaves um, make EMFs. And so, right, virtually everybody has a cell phone these days. And unlike a microwave, which is contained in a box and you don't use it very much, um, you know, it's only on when it's on, a cell phone that you just have, you know, next to you all the time, right, emits these pulsed um, irregular signals that rapidly change the electric and magnetic fields, um, you know, receiving signals from the satellites. And so these irregular pulsed wavelengths are really disruptive to us and to our nervous system, right? Like we are electromagnetic beings, right? That's why laser and infrared sauna and um, ultrasound, like all of these both medical uses and, and health and um, just death techniques that we have work for us and a pacemaker, right? Like our hearts are electrical and that's how our nervous system works. We're, we're firing action potentials based on electrical currents and frequencies. Um, and so we, we are affected by um, the fields around us. Um, and the, the cell phone, um, the pulsing of phones, especially, you know, I just want to focus on cell phones, like thinking higher level, right? Like, um, and, and it's a big impact for us. Like the, the, regulations from cell phones are, are very out of date. Like they're from the 1990s. They only looked at like thermal effects where you, um, you know, heating up um, the phone and the cells tissues. But we know that there are non-thermal effects on body cells and tissues and organs that aren't being accounted for. Um, and so like in, in these regulations are back from the 90s. They used a mannequin with filled with like plastic to simulate the human body. Um, it's like a 220 pound man with an 11 pound head, right? Yeah. So it's like a huge person doesn't account for children and, and women and, and people of different body habituses. Um, and, and it only looked at a cell phone for like a few minutes, right? Like people have their phones like glued to them all the time, you know, all day long, they're on their phones all day long. Um, and so we just don't have regulations that are in line with current practices. So that's a, you know, a disadvantage there. And then, um, you know, the EMF safety is pretty controversial. Um, the um, IARC, you know, part of the WHO labels EMFs as a class to be um, toxin, which it means that it's potentially carcinogenic to humans. And um, so, you know, it's controversial, right, of course, in, in the age of 5G and Internet of Things, everyone wants everything wireless and smart and updated, and and um, that's better for us and our communities. But we're we're being more inundated with all of these exposures, and um, 
And, you know, the other tricky thing is that not everyone responds to EMFs in the same way. Some people are more sensitive than others. You know, people with chronic health issues, um, mold exposure, other chronic infections, they seem to be more sensitive um, to the EMF exposures. And um, what research has showed is that EMFs drive oxidative stress. So oxidation leads to inflammation. It can affect us all, you know, throughout our bodies, but our immune systems and our neurological systems are mostly impacted. Um, we also see EMF exposure tied to reproductive concerns. Um, so they're linked with lowering hormone levels, increased oxidative damage to the uterus and the testes, right? So egg and sperm quality are reduced, which can lead to infertility issues as well. Um, and then because the nervous system is impacted, anxiety, ADHD, depression, all of these mental health conditions can also be impacted. Um, and so it, it's really not insignificant. It's a huge exposure that we have on a day to day basis and and but something that we we do have the power to um, modify and control as well. Yeah, I heard just this morning, actually, a really interesting stat that the average person looks at their phone 80 times a day. Wow. You know, and if that's something that has potential to impact your health, you know, maybe you're thinking differently. But I, I, I wonder for a moment, again, without not getting into to a whole dissertation, are there some like tips just off the top of your head that people could do to kind of be more conscious or reduce, you know, EMF exposure? Sure. Um, so there's lots of tips. Um, the first one is that you can put your phone in airplane mode at night. You know, that's like easy. So everybody should be doing that. You don't need your phone, um, you know, or if you are, you know, our mom and have a kid in college or something, you need to have your phone on and be accessible. You can put it in a different room. Um, you can leave your phone in airplane mode when you are not using it. Um, you can use wired um, headphones. They make some that are um, called like blue tube where it's, it, it reduces the EMF exposure like away from your body right? Like distance is your friend. You want to be away from that. You don't want to be sleeping adjacent to your smart meter on your house. Like it, you know, either don't, you know, remove your smart meter um, or, you know, what can you do to not have that be a bedroom or get that bed as far, you know, away from that wall as possible. The greater distance you have from these wireless devices, the better. Um, so those are some of the like really big high level ones. Turn your, uh, you can connect your computer to an ethernet cable and turn your Wi-Fi off. Don't forget, you have to turn the Wi-Fi off like on the computer itself as well. Um, and and have everything wired, like a, don't use a wireless mouse or wired keyboard or printer. Um, earbuds are a huge one. Everybody has wireless earbuds these days um, using a wired headset is better wired baby monitors like anything that you can get wireless don't <laughs> get them in the wired version um and those are some really higher level ones there are much more you know techniques that people can do depending on their sensitivity um you know there's there's like bed canopies there's paint there's um other mitigation treatments that you can do there's electricity um dirty electricity monitors that you can find and, and EMFs um, meters that you can get to really hunt down your sources of exposure and make sure you're mitigating those. Um, so there's, yeah, there, I think the biggest thing is really distance and trying to not use wireless devices as much as possible. Yeah, I think people sometimes think, well, those are small changes. They, they can't really make that big of a difference, but never underestimate the power of some of those small changes. They can add up over time. And for anyone listening, if you um, go to changetheairfoundation.org and click on our summit tab, we actually have two great talks that focus on EMFs from some of the leading experts. So um, you can check those out for a little bit more uh, information on that. But that, that's really good to think about. That's another example of something we're not seeing. And so again, we're not thinking about it. Now, I know this summer uh, I'm in the Northern Virginia area and we were impacted by the wildfire smoke from Canada. And I mean, so much so to the point that, you know, events were canceled and pools were closed and, and things like that. So I wonder if we couldn't talk for a minute about, you know, that outdoor air quality. People think, well, I'll just go indoors, but really 
you know, I think there was something like up to 50% of the pollution outdoors can make its way into your home. Talk to us about wildfire smoke, because we've seen a lot more of that over the last few years. And how does that impact our health? What can you do about it? Yeah, sure. It's a huge issue, right? Wildfires are on the rise. Um, in fact, the forest area that's burned by wildfires has increased drastically since the 1980s um, due to climate change. And so the areas burned by wildfires um, across the U.S. and in Canada is about twice what it would have burned without climate change. So this is um, a relatively newer um, type of air pollution for us. And more of us are becoming more aware. So I think, you know, it's, uh, I'm in Seattle on the West Coast and we've become more aware, but now the East Coast this past summer is more in tune with it now that it's impacted them as well, because it's it's a global issue. And even if the fires are way up in Canada, they affect you know us down here and all over the country. And, and um, those plumes were going even across to Europe. Yeah. So it, it's definitely um, a, a global issue. And Wildfire is especially um, toxic. The um, particulate matter, um, the trees are, there's extra carbon in the air pollution. And so that um, generates more free radicals. It causes more inflammation in our bodies, uh, more oxidative damage to our lungs. Um, and then not only are trees burning, but there's often cities, you know, when cities burn down, think of like everything in your house that's toxic, the plastic, the metals, the cleaning chemicals, the pesticides, electronics, wiring, you know, building materials, furniture and paint, like all of these are volatilizing, they're going into the air and our smoke and that we're breathing it in. It's settling back down, you know, the ash is falling on our, our fields, our agricultural fields, getting into the plants that we eat. You know, it's a, a not just an acute, I mean, there's definitely acute issues, but there's also long term toxicity issues that we need to be aware of. Um, and and so, yeah, the wildfire smoke can be especially toxic compared to just regular you know, traffic pollution, for example. Um, and then we can have both acute and talk chronic health effects. Right. So acute, you think of, um, you know, like headaches. Uh, allergy type symptoms, irritation in your mouth and your eyes and your throat. Um, and then we see lots of uh, increases in cardiovascular and respiratory events. Um, lots more hospitalizations happen. You're more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke or an asthma attack, especially if you have those underlying conditions. Um, and then the chronic health effects, you know, we're, I think we're still um, unraveling all of those, but we see associations with cancer, um, big body systems, our reproductive system, our immune and neurological symptoms, systems um, can all be impacted. And really, you know, the bottom line is that air pollution causes oxidative damage, it causes inflammation. Um, and any health condition that you have can be exacerbated from these exposures. Um, and then there's like mental health concerns that we need to think about as well. Like if you're stuck inside for weeks and weeks, like think about the people that live in Canada, um, you know, they were from May until like October, they've been inside and not able to breathe fresh air um, or as fresh as they want it to be. And that's a huge mental health aspect too. Um, people become isolated. They can't exercise. They can't access healthy foods. Um, so there, there's a lot of compounding long-term effects that we see um, with these wildfire events. Yeah. You know, and I, I think this is one of those things too, where it's, it's a, I think a lot of people, you know, at least in our area started thinking too, like, oh, like, should I be, should I be like filtering my air? Like when was the last time I changed my HVAC filter, by the way, you need to be doing that if, at least at least twice a year, more often than not, actually. Um, and, you know, if you have standalone air purifier units, um, those can assist too. But good HEPA filtration, um, you know, can can be a good start. And we have some resources, uh, Change the Air Foundation, if if people want more. But is there, is there any, like, tidbits you have for people who might be in an area that is, you know, sometimes impacted by wildfire smoke, things that they can do? Oh, yes. I have lots to say because there's so much we can do to um, improve our indoor air quality. The first thing you want to do is know what your current air quality is. 
Um, and so the the EPA has a an app that you can download for your phone um, or look at it on the web their website. They have a map as well. Um, so airnow.gov or fire.airnow.gov um, for the maps. And so that's more national. It's it's more of a like a 24 hour average. Um, so it's not like the exact immediate what is my right now air quality right next to me. Um, but it is a good like, oh, and then they do predict like what's it going to be over the next couple of days. So it's a really good tool to use. Um, the next website that I direct people to is a, a network of community air monitors for some more granularity of detail um, and some more uh, precision, especially if you live in a rural area that's not next to a government um, monitored air area. Those um, monitors are tens of thousands of dollars. And so the versus the purple errors are sure, a couple hundred. And so you can have a lot more of them. Um, they're they're less accurate because uh, they're not tens of thousands of dollars, but they do calibrate them. And so um, purpleair.com is the website that you could go to for all these community sensors. It's, it's a global company. So there's um, you can get really close to like what's you know, who, if your neighbor has one or you have one, what is it right here in your house right now or near you? Um, and then you can look all over the world too. So that's kind of fun. And then in the on the map in the up, upper left, you can toggle an EPA calibration, turn that on because then it will, because some people complain like, well, like, well, that doesn't match the air now or like all these other websites that I use. They're not all the same. And it, it's true, they, they do use different, technologies. And so it's important to um, calibrate them. And, and so there's a way to do that. Um, so that's two um, resources for how to find out what your air quality is. And then once you know, or like, you know, it's like, okay, yes, it's horrible outside. I don't want to go outside. Um, you what can um, um, filter your air, right? So if you have a HVAC system, definitely use a HEPA um, like a, or even like a MERV 13 or a MERV 16 filter. Those clean really well um, and getting that going. And this is one of those benefits. If you do have a newer tight house, it works a lot better. The um, HVAC system at cleaning your air because you know, it's not pulling in, you know, from a, a leakier home. Um, you can have indoor um, air purifiers in each room, you know, standalone units. Make sure those are um, clean, you know, clean filters to begin with. If it's a really bad fire event, change them afterwards. You know, look at how dirty they are. Keep those clean and um, new so that they're functioning the best. Um, you don't want to, you know, take your shoes off before you come in your home. So you're not tracking in pesticides and oils and chemicals outside. Um, you want to um, really... Um, make sure that you, you know, if you don't have uh, an air purifier in a home, you can make your own like box filter fans. Those are really affordable um, options using like a furnace filter that you tape to a box fan. Those have been shown to substantially reduce particulates. They're not great like forever and ever, you know, a HEPA filter is best, but that's a good um, lower cost option and can really make a, a difference for people in these acute events. Um, stay inside, don't exercise um, outside, and often don't, if it's really bad, don't exercise indoors either, you know, just take a break from that. And then if you do need to go outside, a surgical mask is not going to be helpful. Um, you need a tight, and you know, a, a, a 95 mask, right, um, that is fully on your face. Anything with gaps in it is going to be less efficient. Um, and then ultimately, if it's it's really bad, you need like a respirator type mask from like 3M who will make those with the, the filters on the sides. Um, you can get them that um, there's some rated filters for both solvents and gases that really cover all of the toxicants you would be exposed to in a wildfire event. Um, and then things like, yeah, don't be burning candles and um, vacuuming. Don't vacuum because that picks up dust, like trying to decrease your indoor air quality. Um, I'm sorry, improve, you know, your indoor air quality. Don't add new toxicants while it's a wildfire event. Yeah. 
just a side note on vacuums, because it, it's one of those things I tend to nerd out on a little bit for, you know, getting a good, not only HEPA filtered, but like a sealed system, sealed one. Mm -hmm. um, because vacuums can be leaky. So yes, the, the HEPA filter is great, but air leaks around. You can Google online and see videos of people, they do like smoke tests and you can see the smoke coming out like the sides of the vacuum and everywhere else. And so when you're purchasing a vacuum, the next time you, you have to do that, not only one with a HEPA filter, but one that's a sealed system, because you definitely don't want that stuff, wildfire smoke or not being kicked back up into your um, environment. Well, those are, those are some great tips. And I always like to ask as, as we kind of wrap up here, like, what are, what are some things that you personally do in your home to improve indoor air quality? Um, all of the above. Yeah. Like I have um, a, a MERV 16 filter in my HVAC system. I get that maintained and tested regularly. I have individual HEPA filters um, in my root, the rooms of our, you know, bedrooms, especially in main areas, living areas. Um, we take our shoes off. I use the back burners. I don't use any fragrance, anything, <laughs> all natural um, cleaning supplies and personal care products. Um, we reduce plastic exposure as much as possible in our house. Um, yeah, really just, I open windows on good air quality days, trying to get good circulation. And I'm one of those people that just likes to have that open air. I grew up in Southern yeah. California and just, yeah, like the breeze. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I do that. I, um, yeah, I feel like those are, are some big of the, those big main tips that I have for people. I, um, my husband works in air quality, um, as well. And so I have lots, we, we have lots of conversations. My kids know about you know, air quality and, oh, it's moderate. Okay. You know, yeah, they've got all the levels and know the numbers. Um, so we educate our family on the importance and, and just keep up to date with, um, with all of these tools that we have. Um, and I, you know, also as the um, president of NAEM, we also have our wildfire resource page. I wanted to mention that as well. Um, that includes handouts for both patients and clinicians, more details of what I've talked about today, research, um, treatment protocols, and we have webinars on there. Um, we have resources for community disaster, like relief support. And, um, you know, situations such as the, the recent fires in Maui. Um, and so we, you know, I, I try to share that with all of my friends and family and other clinicians as well. Sorry about that. I, I have a puppy and he must have heard the neighbors come home or something because he's barking. But um, no, and, and we'll link to those websites, like all the websites that you mentioned, we'll link to so that people can find them um, quickly. Um, I, I kind of laughed when you mentioned your kids, because my kids, even though they're young, they very much are, you know, aware. they always comment, like I'll walk into a place and they'll see me like looking up and, you know, I'm looking for like water damage or like snapping pictures. I'm like, oh, she's thinking about mold and air quality again. Or, you know, their friends come over and we have our standalone air purifier units and their friends are always like, well, what's wrong? And we're like, well, nothing's wrong. And we want to keep it that way. Um so it, yeah, it's definitely one of those things like, it, you know, those small lifestyle changes can, you know, really, you know, give you some forward momentum there. Um, so I, before we wrap up, if people had follow-up questions or they wanted to get into contact with you, how could they find you? Yeah, I'm online. Um, I, my website is drkathryncarvelin.com. I'm on Instagram as well. Um, and then the National Association of Environmental Medicine um, is a nonprofit organization, you know, resource for clinicians primarily, and that's envmedicine.com. Um, but we have lots of webinars and um, just kind of general public members as well. And so those are also good resources and, and places to find me. I love that. Yeah, we'll link to both those. Definitely some great resources there. We're, we're excited at Change the Air Foundation to partner with you guys um, as we, you know, go forward in our mission to you know, improve people's health by improving, you know, the air that they breathe. So um, thank you so much for being here. I, I I appreciate you taking time out of your day. And I I think our listeners, you know, you gave some really helpful suggestions that hopefully they can start putting into practice. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you. I'm happy to be here.
And for everyone listening, thank you so much for joining us. If you found this interview helpful, do me a favor, head on over to changetheairfoundation.org, sign up for our newsletter, because it really is the best way to get information like this directly to your inbox. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.